Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Khalid. This is Christina. This is Rima. This is Diana. This is Megan. This is Nicole. And we're studying a lot on our trip. Okay, so first let's talk about our motivation. So malaria is a very common disease. It's a constant threat in approximately to approximately 3.3 billion people all around the world. Um, there's about 300 to 500 million cases per year. Um, over 600,000 of these cases end up in death, and most of those deaths are for children under the age of five. It's also a major disease hazard for tourists that come to those areas and visit, and there's also a great economic cost, 12 billion USD per year. Um, so let's talk about the gold standard. So examination of a stained blood film is considered the gold standard for the diagnosis. It involves staining and a direct visualization of the parasite underneath a microscope. The two tests that are commonly done are peripheral smear studies and quantitative buffy coat test. The quantitative buffy coat test is right here, and there's a peripheral smear study right there. So lab on a chip, what is it? It's a device that incorporates a single or several laboratory functions on a small chip. The chip size ranges from a few millimeters to a few inches. It's ideal for developing countries, and this is because it's cost effective, has faster analysis and response time. It's a safer platform since it requires less fluid, so if it's, there's uh, chemical or radioactive or biological studies, there's less fluid needed to be put on the chip for testing. It also has a wide range of functions. So our focus is lab on a chip that, lab on a chip that protects malaria. It better understands the deformities caused by Plasdodium paroxysticum, which is uh, the parasite that causes malaria. So um, it does this by measuring the deformability of an infected red blood cell. Um, it also assists in evaluating the efficacy of different compounds in treating malaria. So since uh, lavonotrope uses uh, blood protection of malaria, it's important to understand the whole, like the cycle, the life cycle of the parasite. So an infected mosquito first it will bite a human, and the parasite will grow and multiply first in the liver cells and then in the red blood cells where the parasite will grow and destroy the red blood cells and release daughter parasite cells, which will continue to go and destroy other red blood cells. And then um, when another mosquito comes and bites it, uh, an infected human, these, the gametocytes get transferred to the mosquito and then a whole another, cy another cycle continues. And about after 10 to 18 days, the, um, the parasite is found in the salivary glands of the mosquito. And when it bites another human, the parasite gets, um, goes into the human again and this whole process continues. So um, the malaria, gets, the effects are on the red blood cells membrane mm -hmm. and it, it causes um, changes in the phospholipid composition, a decrease in the net negative charge, and an increase in rigidity, and an increase in membrane permeability due to the um, red blood cells are, they're trying to meet the demands of the the growing parasites demands for nutrients and elimination of, of waste, which is what changes the membrane permeability. And it also increases the electrical conductivity, which is the main thing that lab on a chip takes advantage of. And as you can see from here, here's a, um, a normal red blood cell and a par uh, parasite, parasite red blood cell. And the shape is slightly different, and also the, um, the infected one is more permeable to ions. So at low frequencies, um, when uh, when the electric fields pass through the diseased one, they'll pass um, they'll pass through it, and a normal one it'll pass around it. Alright, uh, dielectric paresis works through applying an alternating electric field between 10 kilohertz and 100 megahertz to a cell, and it also <laughs> it is also dependent on the cell structure, composition, and the plasma membrane. Uh, DEP differentiates between cells based on their DEP frequency dependencies, just as Christina mentioned. And it's because the electrical conductivity of the, um, the infected membrane is significantly higher at 9.03 versus the normal membrane, which is only 4.4. And this leads to, well, and it's due to the deformities caused by the malarial parasite. And also, uh, DEP is a non-invasive um, procedure because it does not kill the red blood cells, so they're they're useful afterwards. And the differences the dielectric the differences in dielectric properties between the normal cell and the infected cell cause them to migrate towards different energy positions on the chip so you can tell you, so you can differentiate if the person has malaria or not. 
And um, the, you can also calculate the dielectric force, and it's comprised of two components. The force of the in um, homogeneities, which is F in home, and F traveling, which is F trav. And the in homogeneities force attracts or repels cells from electrode wedges, and F traveling carries cells parallel to the, to the electrode surface. And this is the overall equation for calculating the DEP force, where V is the the volume of the particle, the epsilon is the, elect the electrical uh, permeativity of the medium, and that's all. And this right here is the real component of the clausius mazzotti factor. I'm not sure if I said that right, but um, and that determines the electrical polarization of the cell with respect to the medium it's in, and this is the electrical gradient from the alternating electric. Okay, um, so in addition to the dielectrophoresis, we also are going to use field flow of fractionate, fractionation, which is basically placing the particles in different areas of the parabolic flow velocity. So um, based on the forces, which is gravitational and the dielectrophoresis forces, the cells are placed um, in different velocities. So because of that, they'll leave the chamber at different rates. So the ones that are placed in the middle of the chamber are going to exit first, and the ones that are placed towards the sides of it will exit last. So we start off by a sample. We have the sample, and it has buffers in it to protect the erythrocytes. And we also tag the erythrocytes, both the normal and the ones that have malaria. And um, we place them into our lab on a chip, which is those diameters, so it's very, very small. And it contains copper electrodes at the bottom. So on these copper electrodes, we um, run an AC signal through them. And the AC signal allows for um, the, the particles to, to separate. So you have, let's say, like the normal one, the one on the left, and the, um, the, the malaria-containing one, one on the right. So they separate according to their forces, so the field flow fractionation, which is caused by the dielectrophoresis that is being applied at the bottom through the uh, electrodes. So right now, what they're using is a cy cy flow cytometer, which is um, analyzing at what rate these um, fluorescent cells are leaving the chamber. So you have the um, infected erythrocytes leading much faster than the total erythrocytes in the normal erythrocytes. So based on that, they want to be able to make the chip completely, com completely portable so that you don't have to rely on the flow cytometer to um, use it later on. All right, so now we're going to compare the chip to the gold standard. And the chip is way faster than the gold standard. The gold standard usually takes about an hour after it is transported to the lab. The chips are designed to take less than three minutes to show results for the whole process. The cost factor is important because malaria is most common like in developing countries where they don't have the resources to diagnose and treat the individual. So by, in, by decreasing the cost, we're also increasing the availability to the individuals. The sensitivity for the gold standard is dependent on the technician skill and experience. It's usually low, about four parasites per microliter of blood. So this means that there's a lot of false negatives associated with the gold standard. The chip is designed to be ultra high sensitive, about one parasite per microliter of blood. Ideally, this means that the false negatives and the false positives are eliminated. The prototypes are also designed to be highly specific and able to identify all strains of malaria. This makes the device more valuable and useful for us. The biggest advantage is that we eliminate the skilled technicians like the pathologists and this reduces the cost. Also the chip can be used on the spot and this reduces the time processing and makes it faster to diagnose the diagnose and treat the individual so this makes a difference in saving a lot. So in conclusion, the measurement um, for our device is the blood cells. The sensor is the DEP and the FFF. The signal processing is the flow cytometer. The output display is the graph produced from the flow cytometer. So here's the image of what we would like, or what researchers would like the chip to look like. So as Nicole said, the data from the cytometer 
shows how the normal cells leave the chamber last. So if we apply an alternating current, we can have the affected cells, um, the infected cells, only pass through the chamber and lice them from there. And once they're lysed, we can run a PCR and check for malaria. And this all could be done on a chip <coughs> without the flow cytometer, and so it's portable and lightweight. Um, the future for a future application for the lab on a chip is the lens free microscopy on a cell phone. So what it is, it's a small, compact, um, lightweight holographic microscope, and it produces fast, accurate data, and it will tell you results instant, almost instantly. And so it can be installed on any cell phone with a camera, and that's important because almost everyone has a cell phone already, even in third world countries. They all have a cell phone, so it's easy to use. So what you do is um, you place the sample on the chip, and right here, you put the sample here, and it will give you the image of whatever you're um, trying to see. So if it's a malaria parasite, you can see it. We have about three and a half minutes for questions. Um, are those are these lab chips reusable or is it a one time test? <coughs> There's different designs. Some are uh, designed so that you can reuse them, but that has like a lot of problems because blood you could be contagious. Mm -hmm. But so most of them because they're um they cost so little. It's more efficient to just um, use a new one each time. But the reader, that one you do reuse, and that's the initial investment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there other diseases that this chip can be used to um, identify? Because yes. it's like, it's malaria, so could it be used for like sickle cell anemia or for someone who has a, like, a bunch of other diseases that are common in a third world country like typhus? Uh, currently, well, from what we what we read, it, um, it also detects tuberculosis too, as well as various strains of malaria. And they're trying to expand how many pathogens it can really detect. And lab on a chip isn't just a diagnostic tool. Um, you can use it in the lab, and you can even use it like to mix things. Like like if you want to mix like a certain amount, you can mix it with lab on a chip. So it's it has multiple uses. It's not just to detect a, a disease. What do you mean by mix things? Like if you um, if you wanted a certain amount, um, sometimes it's really specific how much you need to mix two things together. So you'll insert a certain amount into one side and then to the other. Because it's so small, it'll be able to mix it in the middle while turning the lab the lab on the chip. What are you mixing? It could be anything. It could be a protein solution with another protein solution. It could be an, um, any mixture that you want. Like the reactions, it's commonly used like for PCR. So you need the reaction. It also has like um, heat sensor things that provides the heat for the PCR. Any other questions? Okay, well, uh, what was the correlation between the lab on the chip and the cell phone microscope? The cell phone uses the lab on the chip, so you can put the... It's another type of lab on the chip? Yeah. So and it's not the cell phone is the reader because you need a reader to read the the lab on the chips. Okay. They're so like, those are recyclable. So you need a reader to in, to replace the mas the microscope. So you just put the, the lab on the chip right here. Oh, so there's like a program in the phone. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So are you guys essentially saying that sometime in the future, maybe one or two decades from now, practically anyone on the street, if they have a cell phone, they just whip it out and tell them like they have a certain disease? Yeah. 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 Developing it, 
It's mm -hmm. specific, like the one that we're using right now is barely being developed. So they're still trying to put it all in one chip because they have they still have the flow cytometer that they're running their tests with. So they haven't been able to. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, like kind of related to that last question. Are there like are there any figures on things like false positive rates, uh, false negative rates that 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 kind of thing been done yet? Uh, because it's still like prototypes. There's some data, but none that was published, so uh, I didn't want to put that in. Okay. Or right. do you have a question, James? Uh, so they haven't started doing a clinical trial yet. Well, they use the blood from humans that are derived from humans to run it through, but they haven't been actually like gone and tested it because it's not a complete lab on a chip yet. Any other questions? Okay.